Good day and welcome to this pre-event. It's a pre-event meeting with the press at this seventh global platform of the disaster risk reduction. And our special guest today is Mami Mitsutori, who is special representative to the Secretary General for DRR. So Mami, to begin with, um, I mean, how important is this as an event to you? So this is indeed a very important event. Every global platform for disaster risk reduction is important because it's the occasion where every three years government and also all non-governmental stakeholders come together to exchange views about how we are doing in terms of disaster risk reduction, prevention. This one, I would say, is particularly important because A, we're coming out of COVID. Uh, how do we recover from COVID? Are we really going to build back better? This is a crucial question that we need to ask ourselves. So we'll be talking about this. Second, of course, climate emergency has gone nowhere. So we are facing a pandemic and a climate emergency. And also what is happening in Ukraine is also impacting all of us. So we are facing what we call a multi-crisis. And here, risk governance is extremely important. And when we talk about governance, it's not only about governments, but it's all about everyone, right? So I think that this is the moment when we can at last come together, hybrid, but a lot of people here in person. And the last but important point I would make is that it's going to be seven years since the Sendai framework was adopted in 2015. Next year is the midpoint. Are we achieving what we think we need to? I don't think so. We're not achieving the SDGs either. So we need to enhance our efforts. And this is also an opportunity to do that. Let's move on to some questions from our World Broadcast Union members. And we'll begin with Labi from ASBU, from the Arab Speaking Broadcast Union. Good morning. My name is Larbi Migari. Um, I'm from Arab uh, Broadcasting Union, which is part of the Arab League. Um, I'm representative of the Arab countries here, but I'm aware that my colleagues are uh, representing other media organizations. My question is, how has mo uh, media, how has media developed in the RR in recent years? And how can uh, media uh, move the world uh, from risk to uh, resilience? And how can improve the, uh, the RR agenda? Thank you. Well, welcome, Lavi, to uh, the Global Platform, and thank you very much for your question. The Sendai framework says risk is everyone's business, and it says that we need to approach disaster risk reduction with a whole of society, all of society, society way. And media is clearly written into the document as one of the important stakeholders. I'm very encouraged in the way that media is embracing disaster risk reduction prevention of course, when a disaster happens, media has the role to, to uh, broadcast it to everybody, and that's what you do. But if I may, I think previously, the response part, not only for the media, but for everybody, was a bit more important. Now, I see, thanks to UNDRR's collaboration with the World Broadcasting Union, with the Asian Broadcasting Union, we have uh, training sessions with media. We have exchange with media on the importance of the media to also educate people, uh, your citizens, your audience, about the importance of prevention. Talk about what we can do before a hazard becomes a disaster. And I think in this regard, media has made a great leap. And that's why I believe you know, we have so many of you here at this conference, so I'm delighted with this, um, with this new trend. Thank you, Mami. Uh, our member from uh, Thai PBS is Chalanton. Your question, please. I'm Chalanton from Thai Public Broadcasting Service and also representative for uh, Southeast Asian um, regions. My question is to Thailand and many countries in the regions and globally have committed to the Sendai uh, framework and also put that in their national plans. But in terms of um, in practice, there is not much of follow-up or in terms of checking mechanism to their implementation and not exactly an umbrella unit, umbrella government body to keep that 
on what they did in within the countries. So can you foresee or how do we overcome these challenges? In terms of well, thank you very much for the question and again, welcome. So now more than 120, I believe, countries have national strategies for disaster risk reduction. This is very important because if you don't have a plan, it's a plan for failure. We need to have a plan for prevention. That's the first step. But as you mentioned, we need to implement it and we need to monitor it. I believe that this opportunity of the midterm review process of the implementation of the Sendai framework will tell us how well are we implementing. I also understand that in many countries, although you have the will to do it, maybe you don't have the resources, uh, enough resources financially or uh, human resources to implement it. But that shouldn't deter us. I would say that what's very important, and this is something that we keep on talking, is that disaster risk management becomes the issue of the very highest level, political level of the country, so that the disaster risk management agencies are not left on their own to, to make the plan and try to implement it. But uh, the, from the highest level, the will and the resources come for the implementation. And also, as we always say, the implementation and the monitoring cannot be done in silos. The risk reduction implementation should be a matter of each and every sector of the government. And this is something that we have learned through the COVID-19 pandemic, because even when the public health authorities were trying to respond as well as possible, it quickly became a crisis, a disaster that affected every part of our lives. So all the ministries had to come together, education, employment, whatever. So this also applies to prevention. So we need to have a the highest political level engaging and we need an all of government and all of society, again, implementation. It's not an easy thing, but there, I think there's no shortcut to this. The next question comes from one of our representatives from the African Union of Broadcasters, Purity from, uh, from Kenya. Okay, my name is Purity myself from the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation. Um, and thank you so much for this important course on risk reduction. Let's stay with the implementation of uh, DRR projects. Um, there's the question of accountability and resource allocation. Maybe what are you doing to help the member countries as far as funding and accountability for the resources that you're offering is concerned? Thank you. Financing disaster risk reduction is one of the biggest missing pieces, internationally, but domestically as well. And I think that relates to your question, because if we do not put resources, we, if we do not finance disaster risk reduction, again, the plans that all the countries have won't be implemented. We know through our analysis and our work with the member states that very few a percentage of national budgets go into prevention. It's on average around 1%, let's say, globally. This is very, very little money. Also in terms of international cooperation, when you look at ODA, a rather small amount of ODA goes into disaster-related areas, and of that small por portion, only 5% goes into prevention. The rest goes into response, relief, and reconstruction. So we need to change this. This is something that we are constantly advocating for. This is something that this global platform will focus on. And I believe that if we cannot change the proportion of what we fund after the disaster strikes um, and make it the proportion that we fund before the disaster strikes, then we're not gonna succeed in what we're trying to do. So that is the accountability that is still missing and it's not one country or another, it's basically across the globe. It's globally, regionally, nationally, and even in private sector as well. So let's make that a big theme, and I would like to, to really encourage the media to dig into this as well. The next question also comes from one of our African representatives. Fine Face is from uh, Nigeria. Thank you, um, Fine Face from the Nigerian Television Authority. Obviously, um, achieving sustainable resilience for all costs money. How do you envisage countries' efforts uh, in investing in DRR, especially in this period of post-COVID recovery? So that's a very important question because 
obviously, there is uh, a tendency for all of us to look at the short term, which means to let's put money into um, what we need to see happening tomorrow. And that has been the problem. Now, um, I think that in order to change this, the real first question or the first um, um, challenge is, are we going to or are we putting in money for the recovery of COVID into the right places? Are we putting the money in terms of um, infrastructure, in terms of social protection, um, trying to get out of COVID to make our society more resilient, more equitable and greener? I think this is, this is the question that we need to ask. If we're not doing this, we are missing the biggest lesson or the crisis. Um, we can't waste any disasters, as we always say. And so this is something that I would really like to, again, encourage the media. We will do it ourselves too, to look into in your country, in your region, are the governments putting those trillions of dollars of economic stimulus into recovery that will result in a more equitable, more resilient, greener society. And now with the war in Ukraine, I think it's becoming even more challenging, isn't it? Because, you know, prices of food, prices of energy is going up. But can we stop looking at things only from the short term view and have a bit more long termism? This is uh, the question. And I believe that, um, again, you know, if we don't succeed in this, we won't be able to achieve the prevention agenda. My name is Indra Singh, uh, the head of news for the Fijian Broadcasting. And uh, you've been very, very vocal in Pacific Islands and small island developing states which need assistance. COVID hasn't helped, as you mentioned earlier on, tying it with COVID and disasters. How important has it become for bigger nations to take that important step in assisting these small nations in developing things and funding things like early warning systems, which has been one of your key areas that you've been driving? So thank you very much for that important question. On the 23rd of March this year, which is the World Meteorological Day, the Secretary General of the United Nations announced that the whole UN system under his leadership will endeavor to cover the whole world, all citizens of the world with early system within five years. This is ambitious, but this is something we need to do. And the other day when I was um, um, talking with um, Ms. Amina Mohammed, uh, Deputy Secretary General. She even said that maybe five years seems too long for many countries, like the small island developing states, which are already um, facing an existential threat, you know, rising sea levels and all the climate related disasters. So she was encouraging us to, let's try to even shorten this period. But now we have a uh, uh, end game. Now we have a deadline. So uh, what we will do under the leadership of the Secretary General and the leading agency will be the World Meteorological Organization. We will, um, we will commit to covering the, um, the citizens of the world with early warning system. But I would also like to mention that early warning system has to be multi-hazard. Early warning system has to be end-to-end. -end. Early warning system needs to protect the most vulnerable people and it has to be connected to early action because you can have a great system, but if people do not know how to act to it, then it's not gonna work. And here again, you know, I'm sorry that, you know, I keep on asking you guys, but really, you know, the media um, has a, a big role that you can play to uh, not only forecast about um, the um, early warning system, but when the early warning system is, um, is given to really, you know, um, uh, to convince the people that you need to listen to it and you need to act. It's, your, your voice is very powerful. Many times it's more powerful than even the, the government, right? Um, the broadcasting union, the broadcasters, there's a lot of trust in what you can tell the people to do for their own benefit. So let's work together for a, a early warning system to cover the whole world within five years, but connecting it to early action.
Thank you for being with us, uh, Mami. Namaste. Uh, I'm Gautam Roy from uh, DD News and DD India. Doordarshan is the national broadcaster in India. My question uh, to you is related to extreme weather events uh, like we've been having in India as well. Heat waves, droughts, uh, there's been forest fires, uh, cyclones as well, and uh, they're increasing every year due to climate change effects. Now, what is the UNDR doing to urge you know, different governments around the world to have uh, to frame policies uh, and then to, of course, implement them as well uh, and uh, counter these uh, climate change effects? Well, as you just mentioned, climate change is affecting everybody. 90% of the major disasters of the past 20 years are related to climate change. So, of course, you know, if we cannot um, uh, deal with this, we cannot um, lessen the impact. Climate mitigation is very important, but as you have seen since the last COP26 in Glasgow, climate adaptation is now getting a very important, um, let's say, uh, space in the climate action. We are advocating that 50% of all the climate financing should go to adaptation. And importantly, from the UNDRO perspective, we are advocating so that climate adaptation plans, the NAPs, the national adaptation plans of the countries, and the disaster risk reduction strategies of the countries have a synergy between each other. What does it mean? If climate adaptation plans do not look into all other drivers of risk, particularly around vulnerability, around you know, uh, poverty, around you know, um, gender, then um, it might work solely in the, in the area of climate action, but it's not going to reduce the impact uh, on the people and especially the, the most vulnerable people. So uh, we need to have all disaster risk drivers included in the national adaptation plans. This is what we're advocating. At the same time, all the disaster risk reduction strategies need to not only focus on the historical disasters that a country has been, um, has been experiencing, because all countries are now experiencing more and more new types of climate-related disasters, the DRO strategies need to also embed the future climate risk. And that is the only way that we can, while climate mitigation goes forward, uh, deal with um, the climate-related uh, disasters. And as you mentioned, heat waves, droughts, you know, these are only going to be more challenging even uh, while we mitigate. So I believe that the answer is uh, looking at all drivers of risk, in particular of vulnerability. Thank you so much. My name is Jennifer Simwe from Uganda Broadcasting Corporation. My question is, what is your plan or plans for this year's platform? For this year's platform, yes. So this year's platform, as I mentioned at the outset, responding to Russell's question, is we need to really move from risk to resilience, which is the the three key words of this global platform and achieve sustainable development for all in a COVID-19 transformed world. Now, I'm just reading the titles, but the title of this global platform is really the essence that we need to um, see coming out. The other thing is that we need to see action coming out from this global platform. We will talk about our lessons learned. We will talk about our challenges. But importantly, we need to talk about solutions and solutions that can be scaled up. And when this global platform is over successfully, hopefully, on Friday, and when everybody goes back to where they come from, we need to start implementing them from where we are, each one of us, the UN system, the member states, the non-governmental stakeholders to implement the words that we will hear and we will discuss with each other. That's what uh, we need to hear. Interestingly, 60% of the people who have registered to this global platform are newcomers. Um, I think that's quite striking because previously maybe we were talking among the converted about the importance of prevention, disaster risk reduction. Now with COVID, 
and the climate emergency becoming more and more fierce, there is a new audience, there is a new group that has a keen interest on what does prevention mean, what does disaster risk reduction mean, and hopefully this keen interest will turn into a focus in their action. So that's what we need to see from this um, global platform. And I think the fact that we are having this in Indonesia, which is such a disaster prone country, but because of that has built a very resilient society to all kinds of disaster is in itself a very um, a, a strong example that we can all take back home. So um, let's hope that that's, that will be coming out. Um, and, um, and I'm sure that you know um, the fact that you are all here and you will be broadcasting about what's happening here uh, to your country, to your regions, mean that the message can reach far more than within this Bali conference. <laughs>